Isn't that nice? Now, a giraffe, of course, has got very good eyes. But the wind is blowing straight from us onto that giraffe, so there's no question that he doesn't smell us as well as see us. But what's really nice is that he is not reacting in a manner that suggests he sees us as a threat at all. So I'm just going to walk gently closer towards him. And it's important, of course, at this point not to try and hide. Now, a legend... <laughs> A legend, you want to know how much they eat during a day. How many kilograms? You know, I actually have no idea. I'm going to guess they're 1,400 kilograms for a big male, and that's roughly the same size as a rhino cow, and she would eat probably in the region of 30 kilograms of food a day. He's a ruminant, which means he's going to be more efficient. So I'm going to say probably between 15 and 20 kilograms of food a day for a big bull sounds like a lot but it's probably not too far off for that and that of course excludes the cocoa pops so sneak a little bit closer stop again let him look at us Now, little candy, you're wondering if a giraffe would charge at a human being like an elephant might. No, almost universally they will move away. If you managed to get close enough to a cow and a calf, and she felt sufficiently threatened, or that you were threatening her and her calf sufficiently, then she might try and give you a kick. But no, they wouldn't very seldom be provoked into a charge. If you got close enough to one that was running away, it would kick you. But they very seldom turn and actually attack. Now we move slightly away from him, so we broadside him. And that means that he doesn't see us walking straight towards him, which is normally quite useful. Now he's just a bit nervous of us. There we are. That's a beautiful view of a giraffe. And... You can, in fact, I don't think he's going to drink, but oh, goodness, it would be wonderful if he does. You can, in fact, get up to giraffe or encourage him to come up to you. If you sit in a clearing, and, or in fact lie down on your back in a clearing, and just wait, if you've got sort of a couple of hours to spend in a day, they will come and investigate you. And I've done it once where I had five or six giraffe within sort of... Well, I think 50 centimetres at one stage, so less than two feet. They were looking down at me like that, and I could almost reach out and touch their hooves. There we are. Quite a strong wind blowing. The country at the moment is in the grip of a lot of fairly, what should we say, wet weather. And that's brought with it quite a lot of cold as well. We need the water. But I'm not sure that we need the cold so much. I suppose we'll be grateful for it, as I say. Uh, this is a very, very hot time of year normally. Now, the reason we've come to Twin Dams was, of course, to see if we could find some leopard tracks. We haven't found any just yet. So we'll keep up our search. He's fascinated by us, almost as much as we are fascinated by him. I see the hippo from Twin Dams has disappeared. F is it Vegas or Fega? <laughs> ah, Las Vegas. Uh, Vegas, you're wondering at what age the ossicones harden on the giraffe. Well, it takes them about three days to stand up and then fuse with the skull. After about six weeks or so, I suppose, they'll be fully fused. But uh, they're born, of course, with their little ossicones lying down. And then when they come out, they'll sort of spring up. And then after about three days or four days, they stand upright. 
and then begin the process of fusing onto the skull. After which, it's probably six weeks until they're solidified on. But they're not, I mean, as far as I'm aware, baby giraffes, ossicones, aren't soft, you know, in the middle. I think they're still quite bony. Ooh, there is a hardy dar making a very loud sound. Oh, I wonder if they've got that nest back there. We'll go and have a look. While we do that, let's head back across to the Maasai Mara, where I believe Leo Smith has left his lions and is on the hunt for something else. There's little birds on the ground. See them? There we go. Tamex courses. Oh, sorry, it seems like I'm having problems with my comms again. So, there we go. Um, little Temex courses running around. Beautiful little birds. And uh, we're quite spoiled here in the morrow. I, mean, I only saw them once at... Once or twice uh, in the Sabi Sands. Now, they move around after short grass. So, of course, the morrow's got plenty, plenty of that. So little ground nesting birds, and uh, they occur all the way from sea level to about three thousand meters, wherever the, the the terrain is correct. Whoa! Nice camera work there, Arch, keeping up with a scuttling courser. Now we've been checking all the regular spots for the Olololo Pride, and I'm having absolutely no luck finding them. Oh, what did you catch? So they feed off of various hosts of little insects that live in the grass. You can see they're very active little hunters. And they'll only really take off in serious danger. Quite often, even when they're being chased by something, uh, they'll still keep to the ground. And you can see they're very nippy along the ground. And they've got a, a very sort of mournful call which is quite strange. I'll play it for you now. So you do hear that, and quite often at night or around sunset, um, you'll hear that sort of little tip, quite nasal. But we've had no luck with the lions so far on this side of uh, the triangle. So we're going to keep heading. I've got a few more spots um, where the Olololos like to hang out. I want to see if they were successful last night because they were still hungry even after snacking upon two baby warthogs. And the majority of that, those baby warthogs all went to the cubs, of course. Okay, I'm going to try to fix my earpiece here. I'm not sure who we're going to, but I'm sure they've got something wonderful. Of course there's something wonderful. We're on safari. So, we are here at Chitwa Dam, right in front of Chitwa Chitwa Lodge. And we are just positioning ourselves. We're going to have a look for the hatchlings, which I know you all love. And then we found a hippo or two. All right. I think, Viam, are you happy like this? You want me to back up a bit? Sorry, guys. I know I'm rubbing my eye right now. I had a little midge fly into my eye so please excuse me for that all right so we've got some nice hippos and the sun has come out really nicely it's starting to warm up there's definitely a mum and a youngster but i don't think it's any of the oh that's where they are Vim. they're far 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 down there by the inflow 
and to, yeah, just just that side and then to the right as well. So I think after we have a nice little look, there we go, for our hatchlings, we'll possibly go down that side and see if we can see them a little bit better. Um, the hatchlings are usually just down in here, sort of where the dead branch reaches the bank. But it's super, super cold. So I have a feeling that they're probably in the water there. Because I'm not seeing them at all. But if this sunlight stays the way that it is and warms up a little bit, we might get a chance. Oh, beautiful. With a red build um, buffalo weaver. Still trying to maintain their nests here. Can hear the water thickness in the background. Scruffy looking buffalo weaver. <laughs> VM it's a very scruffy looking buffalo weaver. It's true, but it's been it's been windy, and I've been watching the several times that I've been here. I've been watching, and a lot of the buffalo weavers have been arguing with each other quite a bit and picking at each other. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with them maintaining and rebuilding parts of the nest and just getting a bit agitated. And this one likes this spot and this one doesn't like that one. And let's see what we can do and moving themselves around like that. And they're, oh, there's the hatchlings coming out just underneath. Um, yeah, and then to the right, it just moved up and a little bit more right there. It came out of the water and then it's in exactly, it's in behind those you can just see the tail excellent can everybody see just that little bit of tail just moving into the water there with a little bit of spiky bits coming out <clears throat> so exactly they were in the water to keep themselves warm and then now they are coming up because there it's moving because the sun is going to be easier for them to warm up with now than the water itself remember <clears throat> crocodiles are ectothermic technically poikilothermic needing outside temperatures to regulate their inside temperatures as opposed to mammals like the hippo we were looking at that regulate from the inside but then also outside temperatures do help dictate um, the, that inner regulation but not as much as, as with the poikilothermic creatures Fantastic. So it's not the best view of the hatchlings, but they're still here. It's just the one that we've seen. I believe the total we've seen is three. Um, I haven't really seen any more. I don't know if you all have seen more in the, f the times that we've been in and out and Tristan's been here and anyone else has been here. The hippos are playing with each other a little bit. Oh, that sunshine is absolutely fantastic. There we go. It's amazing how much something like a little bit of sun ups your mood. Sorry, I was just having a look <clears throat> at our island of nests straight ahead. I was looking for that goose <laughs> that makes me laugh every time, but the goose is not in its nest. The weavers are still busy, so the, the big scraggly parts are the red-billed buffalo weavers, and then those very nicely made um, sort of sacks that are hanging there. I've seen village weavers and southern mass weavers and lesser mass weavers all busy around that area there. Robert, you're asking a fisher in the water. Yes, there will definitely be fish in this water. There'll be things like tilapia. Also wouldn't surprise me if there, there's barbel, catfish in this water as well. Um, there's a pair of fish eagles that live here and we've watched them catch a couple of things. Definitely some fish species. I'd be interested to see if there's any other species, but usually it's, it's tilapia and, and barbel. There's another name that's sort of tickling the back of my head right now, but it's not coming to the forefront, so I'll have to have a think on that and see if I can, I can remember. I'm thinking because of where we're sitting and where our main hippo pods are, I'm thinking let's move around 
and see if we can maybe get a better visual on them. I'm also hoping that with this warmth coming up, we might start seeing some elephants coming through. And then VM and I are, are hoping that a leopard decides to pop up and show itself. As you know, they really like to be on the outflow on the back side of the dam wall. Um, and it's not very chilly anymore. And so we might just get lucky with that. So I think let's start meandering over to the inflow. Vildi, I'll try not to topple you over into the, <laughs> into the dam. Sorry about that, little bit of erosion. Excuse the bump. It's a really beautiful scene this morning. We're gonna get a nice, nice view of the the hippos down at the other side. And then we must just check nicely for our birds as well and see what species we can get because again, with the sun coming out, the insects will start coming out as well. We've got lots of swallows and swifts that are flying above the dam at the moment. So swallows and swifts, swifts to me, oh look, swallows are interesting, but swifts to me are super interesting. They don't, after they leave their nest, they don't land. They fly and fly and fly and fly and they only land again when they go back into their nest. I mean, the amount of energy and aerial dexterity that it must take to function like that is huge. We have a sandpiper. Let me just see if I can get us a little a viewing on this sandpiper here. Looks like a marsh sandpiper, but I just want to triple check with my binos. The supercilium there, that little white eye stripe. If it shows me the color of the legs, that will be helpful. A little bit yellowy green there. All right, let's triple check my book. Oh, if you guys could be sitting here with me now, you know those crisp autumn days that you get in the, in the northern hemisphere where it was chilly and then all of a sudden the sun just warms your, warms your skin up a little bit, but you're still feeling that crispness and then it, it almost feels like a soft caress on your face. That's what that sun is like right now. Sandpiper. All right. Hadida! Hadida! Okay. It's not a marsh. Sorry, give me two seconds here. I actually think it's a wood sandpiper, to be honest with you. With the eyebrow stripe that was there and the coloration on the wings and the color of the legs. That's what I will, I'm going to go with. The marsh, I'll just turn the page for you. <clears throat> is, it does not have the same coloration along the wings and is a lot, a lot, um, a lighter in color. Sorry, did you, Chris, did you say Bev agrees with the wood sandpiper? Nev, Nev, thanks Nev. I'm glad you agree with me. I'm definitely going to go with that one as well. Okay. <laughs> so James is on his little Friday stroll and let's see what he has to say to us as he meanders about. Well, what I was going to say to you is that we had some Impala, which uh, we did have. Unfortunately, they seem to have taken fright, possibly because Senzo is a terrifying human being. Come, Senzo. We're just going to see if we can find them again through here, and maybe we'll spot a baby one. This is very much a Friday morning stroll, I must say. Now the sun's out, it's warming up a bit, which is nice. They're astonishingly good at hiding. Let's keep going through here and see if we can't find them. There they are. Straight in front of me. 
Bella, you want to know what the most common animal we see on foot is? Well, I'm assuming by animal, do you mean, do you mean mammal, Bella? I'm going to assume you mean mammal. The most common mammal would be an impala, because they are the most common mammal here. And so we see them more than anything else. But they don't let us get nearly as close to them as some others would. So the, like that giraffe, for example, would let us get to within 20 meters or so. Elephants also sometimes will let us get a bit closer. Buffalo, but not much closer. Let's just walk slowly through here, behaving in a very unpredator-like manner. I'm talking continuously so that the thing doesn't think I have changed my behavior. Yeah, he's not going to let us get any closer than we are now. We're now, oh, I'd say, about 100 meters away. Can you still see him there, Senzo? You can't? No, no, he didn't. I'm looking at him. <laughs> there he is. He's hiding behind a bush. He looks like a startled horse. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the only reason, of course, I can see him is because he is that russety chestnut colour. If he was grey, he would be almost impossible to see there. And, of course, we had this long discussion last year as the spring turned to the summer and the bush turned from grey to green. And the question was, why on earth is he that colour if he's easier to see? And the answer is, of course, that he isn't easier to see if you don't see in colour. If you see in the monochrome that animals do, and it's largely greens and reds that they see, that must be pretty difficult to pick out if you're a predator. Interesting. Let's continue. Ricky Rock, you say, what is that guy doing out of the car, get back? Uh, well, we didn't bring a car with us, Ricky Rock. Unfortunately, we came out on our own two feet. I'm assuming you're probably referring to what you perceive as a potentially dangerous situation for us to be in here on foot. Now, remember, this is obviously um, a question many people ask. The thing about being on foot here is that human beings evolved in Africa, which means that we've been walking around on foot here with these animals, uh, well, our ancestors have, for probably around about five million years. And since that time, we've been defending ourselves firstly, and then hunting animals much, left, much more latterly. And that means that the animals here see us as predators. Everything from the elephants to the lions down to the squirrels see us as something to be afraid of. And therefore, it is actually relatively safe to walk around here. Obviously, you need to be very aware of what's going on. So, for example, we nearly walked into those lions today. That would have been okay. We'd have probably picked them up. They would have growled at us before we sort of stomped on them. And uh, the interaction would probably have gone something like they'd have stood up, maybe growled. We would have waited to see what they did. And then they would probably have moved off or we would have moved off. It is extremely unlikely that they would have pushed home some kind of lethal charge. So that's the case with just about every single animal out here. And although it seems very dangerous for us to be out here, it really isn't. And, uh, you know, the danger is often overemphasized by people who want you to think that they are particularly brave and courageous to be out here on foot. But as long as you know what you're doing out here, it really can be relatively safe. Let's head back across to Noel now, who is sitting with an animal that does see animal, at least humans, as fair game. You are correct, James. We are with one of the only animal species, the only one that I know of on the African continent that actively hunts humans, and that is a crocodile. So this is the mama crocodile of the little hatchling that we saw earlier. This is the first time I'm seeing her out of the water, and she is a big lady. She's much bigger than I originally thought. Uh, we were chatting the other day about what would she eat, and I was saying maybe sort of smaller antelope, but she's fully capable from from her size, from what I can see, of definitely catching a full-grown impala. Um, but yeah, most definitely. Now it's interesting, even though she sees us as uh, as food, potential food, um, she's actually quite a good mother. So she, we've seen her lurking around where her hatchlings are. 
And when they, when they hatch and they come out, she'll sort of put them in her mouth and she'll move them where they need to go and then she'll, she'll definitely keep an eye on them for a little bit. So she might not be the best creature for us to be around. She can launch herself twice her own body length. Vildi, how long do you think she is? About two and a half meters, three meters, longer. I'm going to go with maybe two and a half, three meters. I'm going to stick closer to three for now. Um, and so that means that she can jump about six meters out. Ooh, Brent has one of my favorite birds up in the Mara called a pintailed wida. So let's head up to him so you can get a view before it flies away. Oh dear, it didn't want to be on camera. It was in that patch, it just took off at that very second. How unfortunate, let me see, where did it go? It flew straight over my head. But we do have some buffaloes and some warthog, but no more pintail wider, he flew off behind us. That was unfortunate. Come back, wider bird. There we go, nice little herd of buffalo. Enjoying, oh yeah, come back, the pintail water's back. There he is, he's landed next to us. There we go, well done, Arch. Oh, there we go, there it is. So you can see why it's, well, and off he goes again. He's, he's a busy body this morning. You can see why he's um, uh, one of uh, Noel's favorite birds. They are incredibly gorgeous. Now, during the non-breeding season, he becomes very drab and uh, loses that long tail and that coloration. Oh, I saw another bird up ahead. Oh no, it's made its disappearing act again. The birds are not being on, on or behaving well today. No, no stop flying away. Okay, let's wait, see if they land. Oh, and they all land where we can't see them. Let's get a bit closer. So I wanted to check whether these are female pintailed widers. Or they were finch larks. Can you see them? There we go, well done. Oh, and off they go again. Uh, looks like they might land in the road. There we go. And they are hopping about. Now, those are female pintailed widers. So the male looks very similar to that during the, the non-breeding season. The moment, that's why he's fluttering about so much, is he's trying to corral all the ladies. He wants more than three. So he keeps flying between a few different groups. Okay, let's keep moving. Uh, let's get a bit closer to these buffaloes. Oh, it sounds like the birds are making a late appearance of the sunrise spray. So let's go back to Noel with a bird that can walk on water. Not really. We have an African jacana who is out on the, the side of the water you can see here. There's no lily pads for it to walk on. Vildi was just commenting now, he's wondering if this bird has the largest foot size to body size ratio. And I don't think I'm going to disagree with him, but it's, we're, just, uh, we're just contemplating it. It's not a, a fact that we're thinking we have. What I find most interesting about this bird is that unlike the weaver's nest that we were looking at earlier, where the male, the, the lesser mass and those, uh, those village and the southern mass, where the male will build a nest and then if the female likes it, they go in and mate and they eggs, um, and then he goes off and builds another one. With the jacana, the female goes, mates with the males, lays eggs, and then leaves him behind to watch over the eggs, raise the chicks, and carry on, and she goes off and finds another male. So you get, um, I'm going to try to remember these terms correctly. 
catch me out if I'm wrong and I will triple check I've got more homework again so you get some uh, polygamous creatures like the the weavers and the jacanas and I believe it's polyandry when it's one female with many males but I will triple check for you on on that it's an interesting adaptation that they've created so now this one that we're looking at uh, male and female are, are virtually look the same so I cannot tell you which is which and uh, for now we're just going to go with it's a jacana wonderful and then we've got Vildi has found us another crocodile across the way that's almost as big as that one that we saw earlier. So I was asked a question a couple of weeks ago, how many crocs are in this dam? Well, at least two big ones. Carlene, you're asking how you tell alligators and crocodiles apart. Well, the first big one, Carlene, is that we only have crocodiles here in Africa. We don't have alligators. Alligators occur in um, the southern parts of North America um, and then you, you get saltwater crocs in Australia and then when you go farther south from North and Central America into South America around Brazil area you get caimans which are similar um, it also has a lot to do with the nose I believe and the alligators having more of a blunt nose if I'm remembering correctly but Carlene farther than that um, I would have to get back to you. That is not a question I've been asked in a long, long time. So <laughs> my, my file 13 is not, is not engaged at, at the moment. So Carlene, you've also given me a little bit of homework to review um, and I'll get back to you this afternoon. I hope you'll be watching with us then as well. We've got a little pied wagtail that's come up on this branch here called a wagtail because it in fact wags its tail there's a little hippo audio for you while we reposition for the best light for these hippos let's head over to James who I believe has a scorpion of a kind we have got a whip scorpion here, but I've just lost it. It's stuck its breathing tube under the water. Wait, let's just give it a few minutes. You got it? No, I'm the edge next to you. I can't see it. It's got a little breathing tube that is often the only thing you can see. I may just have to push my stick into the water and see if I can't make it push its head out. It is quite phenomenal. I can't believe we've been watching this thing now for at least 10 minutes. There it is. Okay. Follow the line of my stick. You following my stick, Senzo? It's just on the surface of the water there. Can you see it? It looks like a, a narrow piece of grass sticking out from under the surface I'm right there you got it there we go Can you see it <laughs> let me move a little closer I, I will try and expose the entire scorpion look at my finger there oh no I dropped a peek there you see it there Can you see it there? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I can see Can that. you see it, Kirsten? Okay, so that's the breathing tube of the whip scorpion. Now, what I will do is just try and show you the actual animal. See if I can make him come out. Come on. Out you come. And he looks terrifying, but he's not really. He's completely harmless to human beings. So that's a stick. I managed to get him out earlier. Now, is it Carla? I can't hear you, Kirsten. Cola or Carla? You're saying scorpions can swim? No. 
Oh, Paula. Um, Paula, no, scorpions can't swim. This is a different kind of scorpion. It's not actually a scorpion. It's called a whip scorpion. It's an arachnid. Yes, it is an arachnid, but it can't, it, it's, not, it's not actually a scorpion. So its tail, rather than being modified for stinging, in this case is modified for breathing. It's, it's able to stick its tail out of the water in order to breathe. Like a sort of rear snorkel, if you like. But he's now gone into the mud, I'm afraid. Let me just try once more and see if I can't entice him out. You think he's here? And his shadow sometimes comes up and it looks like a shark in the sea. No, he's very cleverly got away from us. Oh, here he is. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you see him there? He's just there. Oh, come on. You were right here. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to have to give up on this. Let's go across to Jamie. I'll see if I can't get him out, and if I can, then we'll come back to him in the puddle. Don't cry, James, and don't ever give up. Um, <laughs> much like these topi have decided that they're going to enjoy a game of sparring on a bright and beautiful morning. There are two youngish males. I don't think their horns are fully grown yet. I don't think they've quite reached their prime. But they are keeping us really thoroughly entertained. It's not a serious fight. It is a play fight almost. But it's fascinating to watch because I don't think we often see topi sparring. We see them running a lot. They love to run. And in fact are one of the fastest, the fastest antelope that you will see in the Mara. They are built for speed and stamina. It makes them quite energetic creatures, and they do often like to hop and skip about. In this case, they are practicing for when time comes that they will be big enough to compete for access to the females. So although they are, well, they might actually be, they're almost at that point. They are sexually mature, so they are ready to mate. The question is, would they be able to compete with the larger male topis? And topi do what's known as lecking which is where they all gather together in these massive groups, lots of males, lots of competition. Of course, they've finished lec lecking now, and we're seeing the birth of lots and lots of little baby topies. But these, perhaps these boys are planning to practice for the next season. <laughs> that guy on the left's not interested, though. He's just watching. It's interesting to watch as well because they fight in a way that's very, very similar to wildebeest. What are we all looking at? So there's some more enjoying a little bit of grazing. Not as interested in strenuous activity. Well, just to go back to our, our fighting topi, because I think those are the ones you're referring to. You want to know if these are juveniles or adults? They're adults. They are adults. Um, they haven't quite reach their full potential yet I don't think they're almost at that stage so they are adults they're most definitely adults and you can see the thickening at the base of the horns they've just got a little bit more growing to do just a little bit maybe another six months and they'll have reached their full size so these are adult topi and I'll show you if at some point we manage to find some because this is a oh oh we've got a victor no we don't getting to be quite dramatic this battle my money's on the guy on the left what do you think Adrian guy on, the guy on the left guy on the left I think so too I think he's got a bit of an advantage but I will try and show you what a topi calf looks like okay Kirsty, did you say you'll 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 back the guy on the right or did I mishear you <laughs> okay Kirsty's backing the gentleman on the right Adrian and I, our money's on the guy on the left, now we have to try and keep track of them. I actually think Kirsty's, Kirsty's um, chosen champion is larger than the one on the left. The guy on the left just has got that technique, you know, taking on the higher ground. They fight like wildebeest, they go down onto their elbows. Not their elbows, sorry, their wrists. Oh! Oh! 
surprise jab there to the side. Let's see what the goal is in Topi Battles. The goal seems to be to get your opponent's head as low as possible. Possibly your own. I wonder how much soil they've got up their nostrils at this point. This whole fighting technique seems to include bopping your nose on the ground. Oh, it's a battle for supremacy here. Pushing down. Up again. One on the left backing away. Oh, Kirsty's is moving forward. Going on the attack. Scrumming together. Kirsty, I think you might have picked the winner here. I think it was R. Lara Moore. There's a little bit of breakup from Kirsty, but I think R. Lara Moore, you say that the guy on the right has the uphill advantage. Absolutely. I know. Bit of an unfair advantage for our guy, for Kirsty's guy. We better give them names, otherwise, this is going to get very confusing. What about, um. Hmm. Kirsty and Jamie, okay. We shall name the, theme, the male topies Kirsty and Jamie. <laughs> Kirsty on the right, Jamie on the left. Oh, wait, we're getting a swap now. This is going to get confusing. Jamie presenting us with an extraordinary view of its bottom. <laughs> oh, oh. Kirsty moving in for the advantage, pinning Jamie's head to the ground. This is really weird, Kirst. <laughs> I mean, we've butted heads before, but never like this. And down again. Oh, Jamie looking to get some higher ground advantage, which of course in real life Jamie has because Kirsty's quite tiny. Ah, oh, Senzo's on Senzo's on Kirsty's team here. No, Jamie might be on the back foot here, but good boy, Jamie. Oh, this is confusing. Not giving up. Kirsty's Kirsty Topi going in for some serious technique here, diving to the side. There's some sneaky tactics there, Kirsty. Oh, a little bit of encouragement. No wonder they don't get a headache. Perhaps they do. Jamie ready for anything? So is Kirsty. Jamie presenting us with another lovely view of its bottom. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what Kirst just said. Kirst, can you repeat that? <laughs> Comms went a little bit awry. Oh, oh, we've got an incomer. Ah. Okay, so Kirsty, Kirsty's inventing a backstory for Kirsty the Topi. This could get confusing. So, so Kirsty the Topi on the right. Apparently, Kirsty's father died in a fight with another Topi. And this is this is a revenge tale. Technique and preparation, training. We need a montage. Does that make Jamie the bad guy? It does, doesn't it? Oh well. Oh, Jamie's gaining ground. Kirsty's backing away. Oh, now we've done a swap. Okay, so Kirsty's on the left now, everyone. Jamie's on the right. Just to keep track. I love how their tails never stop wagging. <laughs> Keeping flies off the sensitive areas is an important duty. Jamie's trying to gain the, the higher ground advantage. Good topi, Jamie. Kirsty showing a little bit of distraction. Is Kirsty tiring? Jared's buddy, you voting for the topi in the background? <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that. This, this, I wouldn't even call it a spectator. I'm doing a marvelous job of enjoying breakfast, though. Okay, Wh which one's which? Jamie's bottom is on show again, isn't it? That's a quote that could be taken out of context. Okay, Jamie's on the left again. 
Yep. Jared's buddy. I think we've got a victor with a guy who's, who's so dedicated to breakfast. Carbo loading. In preparation for its turn. <laughs> um, okay, Jamie on the right, I think. I've lost track. I'm not sure. Oh no, this is disastrous. I got distracted by our breakfast eater. Okay, Jamie on the left. <laughs> Kirsty says Kirsty is the one that looks like a winner. I think Kirsty's on the left now. It's like one of those games with cups and a, a ball hidden under a cup. I'm trying to keep track of this. No. Oh, oh, Kirsty's going for some higher ground. Yeah, you've got to admire their dedication. Jason, you want to know if Topia are related to ghosts? Go ghosts? Goats. Jamie's on the left now, by the way, I think. Um, <laughs> ghosts. They are, in, they are very distantly related to goats, but not closely related. So, I mean, they, they, they're, close, they're distantly related in the sense that they have hoof, a hoof structure that's quite similar. They've got um, a similar digestive system, but that's about as far as the similarities go. So, Topi are most definitely antelope. They are related. They're part of this, the Hartebeest tribe. Or related to the Hartebeest tribe, um, which includes, of course, the Coke's Hartebeest, which look very, very similar. But I get where you're coming from because they've got very goat like faces. Wildebeest, as well, are quite closely related to the Hartebeest tribe. But no, not, not closely related to goats. Which one's Jamie? It's the one on the left again, isn't it? I think so. I've sort of lost track now. Ah. Ah. Oh my goodness. Siberia Zumi has come up with a backstory for Jamie, who is on the right now, by the way. So, whilst Kirsty the Topi has, a, has revenge on his mind, um, Jamie the Topi has revenge on its mind as well. And that is because Jamie the Topi called the, the last bit of ice cream, but Kirsty, Kirsty the Topi went in and took it, even though it was rightfully Jamie's. So, so Jamie, I think you'll all agree, is fighting for a true and just cause here. If I could remember which one was which, I'm, I think Jamie's on the right now. You go, Jamie. You fight for that ice cream. That's it. Show that Kirsty who's boss. No, don't back away. Ah, just a run-up. Just a run-up. Look at that. Scrubbing forward. You took my ice cream. I'll show you what happens to ice cream thieves. Have a face full of dirt. <laughs> Tail's still going furiously. Spath. Spath? Spath. Spath, you want to know if fighting would make them easy targets for predators? Yes, to a degree. Jamie's on the right now, by the way, from what I can see. Although, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, now on the left. Now in front. Let's say in front. Um, Spath, yes, potentially fighting could make them easier targets if they were seriously fighting, which they're not. They're sparring. They're spatting, if you uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, so Spath, they, they are... They're not seriously fighting, but in the rutting season, which you'll see quite a bit in when it, when May when May arrives and the rutting season for the impala, the males become an absolute target for predators because they are so distracted by their hormones, telling them to fight and to mate and to chase the females round and round in circles. They're exhausted, they're distracted, and yes, they do fall victim more easily to predators. So it pays not to be distracted, but at the same time, their essentially purpose in living is to pass on their genetics, so it's a balance. And fighting antelope do fall foul of predators. Predators are very good at taking advantage of distraction. Just like though, apparently. I haven't managed to find one since I got back to the Mara. But that's okay. We've got this serious grudge match 
between Kirsty and Jamie. I'm I'm not sure who's winning at this point. I I, I feel as though it's pretty evenly matched. Kirsty's horns are bigger though. What say you, you two? Oh, that it's breakfast time. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> That's hungry work. Battling away like this. Jamie pressing home the advantage. Kirsty was distracted by breakfast. You've got to be careful of that, Kirst. The food distraction. Because <laughs> there's carbo loading. Oh, horns locked together. And most of the time, antelope fights are relatively harmless, but they are capable of injuring each other, and they are potentially capable of killing each other. Kirsty standing tall, Jamie standing tall. Are they going to continue, or have we? No, no, we haven't reached a truce. Kirsty just insulted Jamie. Jamie just responded, "Ice cream." Oh, Kirsty pressing home an advantage now, I think. Funnily enough, I think the one on the right has a slightly redder coat than the one on the left, which should seem very suitable given that it's Kirsty's Toby. Come on, you two. It's time to settle this for the ice cream. For our new viewers, this is going to seem utterly bizarre, and I, I, I would apologize, but I'm not even vaguely sorry. To the ridiculous, half the fun. Yes, we're talking about you. You have no idea how riveted your grudge match has the rest of the world. Ding, ding, ding. All right, the first round is over, and while we take a short commercial break in sending you over to James, I don't. Let's go and find out what he has to show you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, while you have your short commercial break, we are going to try and sell you some delicious fruits here. They taste like a mixture of apple pie and roast chickens. The gorgeous Mbezana fruit, or what we also know as the horse's urine. None of that is untrue. This is, in fact, a bush called the horse's urine, a bushman's grape, or mbezana. And we see it every year, of course, but lots of them are now in fruit, much more so than I've seen in the past. And the taste of a ripe fruit can be likened to that of having your Sunday roast chicken dinner mixed in with the apple crumble. And, uh, well, it's... Uh, it's not as pleasant as having roast chicken and apple crumble, but that's what it tastes like. None of these are quite ripe enough yet, and they're all just a little bit, um... Yeah, they're hard. What you want to do is try and find them soft, and in a little while they'll be soft. And the reason it's called the horse's urine is that really, if you, if you break it off and smell the leaves, it's got a very... it's not... <laughs> I mean, I don't think it smells like urine, but it's got a, it's got a very strong smell. It's not particularly unpleasant, but it's very strong, and I think that protects it from being eaten. Now we saw one earlier today that looked on the surface about as big as this, but it was growing on the top of a termite mound, and some of the termite mound had eroded away, and about four feet lower than this little sort of. Ex, ex, what, what am I, is the word I'm looking for? Uh, ex, never mind. Uh, for four feet lower than the bit that was on top was sitting, was this enormous root of probably, ooh, I think the exposed bit must have been about the size of a small football. And so the entire termite mine must have been covered by the rootstock of this quite remarkable plant called Mbezana. That is all I have to say to you. Oh, the other thing I have to say to you, I do have another thing, 
is that we had Tandi's tracks. They have come away from the den site, which was over there, down towards this road here called Ingwe Alley. We're just going to take the tracks there for the last few minutes of the drive. While we do that, let us go across back to Noel and her rather slithering and terrifying reptile. Hello, we have, the crocodile has gone away pretty much. He's gone back, she's gone back into the water. We have this blacksmith lapwing who's propped itself up onto that rock and has been incessantly calling for probably a good 15, 20 minutes. I'm not quite sure what it's really seeing because the crocodile is on the other side, but, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty frantic. Now, the croc that we got closer to, you can just see the head there, it came out of the water again for a little bit and you could see that its belly was super full. It's definitely had a meal. Very hard to tell when it's in the water like that. But it's heading over towards the hippo with the newest baby. Um, the, the little hippo head keeps going up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, right there next to the mum. So it keeps popping. There we go. Thank you for listening. And Viem and I saw the tracks earlier, and I mean those tracks are smaller than the size of, of the palm of my hand. They're teeny, 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 tiny. Now that mum will defend that little one as best as she possibly can. Her jaws are strong enough to crack that crocodile in half, so that, that baby should be fine. And the crocodile knows that the hippo is fully capable of, of thwarting it. So the, where the mum is resting, the mum can very easily uh, sort of lay down there. The baby, of course, is so teeny tiny that he has to keep going down and then pushing up from the bottom to breathe and then down and then pushing up from the bottom. Sometimes they'll sort of get on their mum's backs and rest that way. But this little one is the little one that we found just after it had been born and the other one of the other mothers was eating the amniotic sac and the fish eagle as well still an incredible sighting i really enjoyed that so this baby because it's also so tiny is going to be moving down to go and nurse as well now the rest of the pod is over here having a bit of a snuggle as well with some of the older youngsters so we've had snuggling sticks and now we've got snuggling hippos, snuggling pot of hippos. But Jamie has a bit of action up in the Mara with some topi. So I think let's head up to her and see what we can see. Ding, ding, ding. Round two has begun. And Kirsty on the left, Jamie on the right, I, I think. I moved a bit closer, so I kind of lost track, but that's okay. Our topi battling it out in a grudge match. Kirsty fighting on for revenge for her father. Jamie fighting for revenge for the last stolen scoop of ice cream. Oh, breakfast. Distraction. Wait. Jamie reminding Kirsty that we're meant to be fighting. A battle as old as time. Very clean, though. Very clean battle. There's been no cheating. No foul play. Except for the bird that flew past. Ha ha. I've lost the topi in the background, by the way. Got bored and wandered off. I'm not sure what we'd call that one. Connor, maybe. And it happens in particular with kudu. And I've I've actually found kudu that have, that are interlocked in the past. And in one particular case, unfortunately, had to put the kudu down because the one had died, and it was just impossible to separate the the other one it was they were locked together in a way that was and the, the other kudu had weakened um, before we'd found it so yes it does happen kudu do get locked together there is a famous statue in Skakuza in the Kruger National Park of kudu fighting and locked together it's even even been um, I've never I've never found it but I know of people who found kudu skulls locked together okay well our Topi battle it out. Oh my goodness, Jamie pressing home her advantage, I think. I'm just going to make her the winner. <laughs> Let's go across to Brent, to an animal that has a rather grumpy reputation. Well, 
not me, but that rhino in particular has got a grumpy disposition this morning. Uh, it looks to be a male. It's a bit far away for me to see exactly, but uh, it's moving around. He's been sort of jogging about for the last while. We've just managed to catch up with him. We saw him from quite a long way away. But he's now heading away from us towards the other road, off on his morning patrols. There you go, as he disappears behind the bush, I'm going to have to change my plan. I'm going to have to go back to where I came from, because that's where he's going. Oh, it is a beautiful morning. And it's always great to see a black rhino. I know, it's definitely well, one of my favorites, but I know it's Jamie's. Oh, oof, might even be her most favorite thing in the world, is a black rhino. But they are incredible creatures to spend time with, and we are very lucky we are able to view them in the Mara. Let's have a look now. See if we can get a view from up here. Otherwise, I think we're going to have to shoot round to the other road. I think I'm going to have to shoot round to the other road. Hold on. We're going to go a little bit quicker. And it's all, as yeah, it's, everyone's excited. I'm excited to see the rhino. Um, but the best way to see it is going to be to scoot around back towards the governor's road. So we're just going to fly quickly. Just see him now. He's going to go through the dip. So we should hopefully be able to get quite close to him. Morning, morning, morning. Oh, dusty, dusty, dusty. Morning, 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 morning. Ah, oh, morning, 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 morning. Okay. Whoa, that's a big hole on the side of the road. That's what happens when there's traffic jams. Okay, keep going. Hold on. Oh, there's been a lot of rain, so there's a quite a few new holes, etc. going to concentrate on not hitting another one. Show in the, uh, we only show rhino in the Mara. Now, the reason for being that Oh dear, it seems as though Brent has disappeared off your screens, but we still have the sparring topi, ding ding ding, round three. I don't think these two are ever going to stop. It feels like they're going to be lost, locked in this grudge match forever. Battling together, bashing horns. Jamie's on the left, by the way. Kirsty on the right. I have been keeping track as much as I can. Come on, boys. It's breakfast time now. This is this is the third and final round. If you haven't stopped fighting by the end of it, well, we'll never know how it ends. I think they're tiring though. Jamie's definitely flagging. Oh, struggling to get back up. Neat little hop there. <laughs> oh, distraction. Doesn't pay to get completely engrossed in a fight and not keep looking over your shoulder, as we've just discussed. You know, I think Kirsty's losing interest in this. The topi, I mean. I think Kirsty just wants breakfast now. His breakfast now. <laughs> Kirsty says she concurs. Come on, Jamie, let it go. Is it worth it? Over ice cream? Okay, well, I think I think we've reached a, a stalemate here, and I think that the Topi agree. We'll call it a draw and send you across to James, who is examining more defecation. Yes, indeed, Turd Fridays continue with a spectacular example of steaming hyena dung. This is green, as you can see, and I told you that calcium was green by nature, and that only when it oxidizes and the action of the sun does it go white, and that is what we have here. So here we have a steaming pile of hyena dung, and I must confess to you, the smell is almost indiscernible. So it doesn't smell very bad at all. Now, there are two species of dung beetle here. 
Let me just see if I can expose one. There. Can you see that one there? Sins? Where the stick is. Beautiful black beetle. And then there's a lovely beautiful sort of ruby coloured one as well. Alright, apparently Brent has got his rhino again. Let's go back to him. Well, welcome back. Sorry about that. We disappeared for a second while I was rushing around and we have managed to get quite a bit closer to this rhino and he's giving us the evil eye. They are built like tanks, aren't they? Now, you can see very distinctive sort of tears and notches in its ear and that's one of the ways that rhinos are identified. So, as I was saying, the reason we do show rhino in the Mara is that they are very, very, very well protected and almost every single individual rhino Lamara is checked on every single day by uh, specific rhino monitoring teams. Wow, oh, yeah, you're going to come closer to us? That would be wonderful. No, just having a look at us, I think he's going to head off into the bush shortly. So there's about 10 or 12 rhino in the triangle itself. And uh, the rest on the other side of the river and all the rhino here do go into the Serengeti National Park as well in Tanzania and the rhino teams between Kenya and Tanzania have a, a really incredible understanding and working relationship where they are able to follow the rhinos across boundaries, international boundaries um, and hand them over to the respective teams. So there we go, tails up, that's a bit of a sign he's a little bit annoyed, not sure why. Well, you could be a little bit excited. You might be looking for ladies. They say he's about to disappear into that thicket there. Or oh, hopefully not. Hopefully he walks along the edge of the thicket. Here we go. Spray, spray, scent mark. Oh, he's giving us a wonderful sighting this morning. Joy is wondering, why are his ribs showing? Well, Joy, with black rhino, that, that's quite normal. Um, even with white rhino, the, the, their ribs will show. Uh, it doesn't mean they're in bad condition. It's to do with how their stomach works. So they're hind gut fermenters, so they, they, they've quite bloated a lot of the time. So that is why their ribs show. It's nothing to do with condition. Now, black rhino often have... Oh, and... Oh, no, he's going to pop out the other side of the bush for long, one last second. Black rhino often have wounds and lesions, sometimes from fighting, sometimes just from, from flies. And that's given, given a, a whole bunch of stories about them. And my favorite one is uh, about a rhino and a porcupine. And it's about the black rhino in particular. And it's an old folklore. I'm trying to remember which it's from. I think it could be a Zulu folklore. Or, or so folklore. Uh, I, I can't quite remember, but it is um, the story about why the black rhino spreads his dung. So, a black rhino, when they when they defecate, they kick their dung and they spread it out quite a lot. Now, the main reason for this is actually to ensure the scent spreads over a, a bigger area. But the story goes that the black rhino cut himself on some very sharp sticks, and he had a wound, and he went to porcupine and asked if he could borrow. A quill so he could stitch up his wound and he successfully stitched his wound and black rhino walked like this so they're quite, they're when they walk and uh, while he was walking he was holding the quill in his mouth and he was uh, on his way back to porcupine to give the quill back and he went oh, and he swallowed the porcupine's quill and to this day black rhino is too embarrassed to seek porcupine so he's always kicking around his dung trying to find the quill so he can return it to porcupine so i think it was a Zulu or a fable. I'm not 100% sure. I have to double check. Or maybe you could double check for me. I'm a bit rusty on where it comes from, but it is one of my favorite uh, folklores about why the black rhino spreads his dung. Okay, dog, eh? Let's go see what other wonders we can find in this magnificent ecosystem called the Maasai Mara. Make sure there's no cars behind us. There we go. Starlight is wondering, do rhino ever cross the river? Indeedy they do. 
Um, they are capable. The rhinos can't swim though, but they will cross in shallow areas. Um, so they do cross the river. Um, I was chatting to the warden of the Mara Triangle and one of the females from here went on a wonder across the river all the way up into the Mara North Conservancy. But fortunately, uh, she had a baby as well. Fortunately, she decided that the triangle was the place to be and she came back. It's that female that we see around this area who's got that sub-adult calf. Okay. The soundtrack of the Masai Mara. I'll see if I can find you. And where is he? There he is. On here, Arch. There's a, there's a little bird. And it's one of the most... There we go. Common sounds in the Masai Mara. Uh, a little bit up. There we go. Sitting on a little bit higher. There he is. The Rufus Naped Lark. A very pleasant call and you hear it throughout the Mara. Oh, they mixing it up a bit. DJ Rufus Nape. And they do have a few different calls. That one they're doing... That one is not the more common of the calls. The one he was doing in the beginning is the more common of the, of the calls. We can hear a scaly spur file making a noise in the, ba in the background. Oh, we got some cysticulars calling. Sounds like a pectoral patch. And there we go. Lovely big group of giraffes. Um... How many giraffes can I see? One. Let's go all the way from the left. Let's see if we can count them there, Archie. Um, okay, a little bit more. Where's the first of the giraffe? Uh, yeah, there. So zoo, there we go. Let's zoom in there. How many we got back there? A little bit to the left. There we go. Back to the right a bit. Just to the right of the tree. There. A little bit. There we go. Got two that I can see there. Let's keep going. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven. No, far more if we keep going. Twelve, thirteen. And if we keep going, there must be a good twenty-five, thirty giraffes around here. The others are quite far away. Okay, I'm causing a traffic jam, so we're going to send you all the way back to South Africa to Noel, who's looking at a bird sitting on a nest. Brent, I am indeed looking at a bird sitting in a nest. It's a pale morph of a Wahlberg's eagle. She is sitting on what should be her egg still, possibly a fledgling. I'm trying to remember we're in November. Yeah, could be either. Um, I, I want to go more with the with the chick um, than the egg itself. They tend to do their nesting towards in winter, towards the the end of winter. There. Now, as she ooh, as she starts to warm up, she might uh, decide to take off and go hunting on the thermals. But because of the bite in the air, I'm pretty sure she's just trying to keep her little one as warm as possible so it doesn't perish. So it doesn't perish. Anything that's teeny tiny and, and needs so it's known as um, altricial, it needs its uh, parent support to be raised, similar to humans, is, is very vulnerable to any fluctuations in temperature. And we had that big rain the other night, and then it was very cold and windy yesterday. And then this morning, the sun's definitely helping, but it's... Especially when you're up a little bit higher, like that Wahlberg's is going to be, it's that that chill is, is is biting. To me, it looks like she's maneuvered around and she's having a look, sort of more inside the nest there. Be interesting if we could get a little camera up that side and have a, a look inside the nest. I know that there's some places across the world where they do do those cams. Vildi, isn't there a bald eagle cam somewhere in North America? Yeah. Very, very interesting. 
Our curse is saying there used to be, I'm not sure if it's still up. Now you can see just how high up she is in that tree. We also had a vervet monkey that came past running across the road, but he did not want to stick around for us. It's the first vervet that I've seen in a, in a few weeks. It's good, it means that the, the fruits are starting to come out a little bit more. And we're gonna start seeing them. Vervets are also a really good way to help find predators. They have about 35 different alarm calls, and when they see something like a leopard or lion, they sit on top of the trees and they go, da -da 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 -da, especially for a leopard. Da -da 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 of their 35 calls, five of them are specific. So the leopard one I did, and then lion, um, crowned eagles, snakes, and then humans. And they all have a different pitch and a different tone. But while we are busy looking for one more animal to show you, I believe Jamie has something that she would like to share up in the Mara. I'm just trundling along, to be honest. Not one single lion. It's ridiculous, I don't believe it. I haven't seen a lion since I got back to the Mara. Oh well, I'm just as happy bumbling about finding random topi battles and whatever else we can find. So I've looked for the sausage tree pride, I didn't have any luck with them. I looked for the two young males, but the one has a collar, no sign of them. Looked for Scar, no sign of him. Looked for the Magoro pride, no sign of them quite tragic really. So now we're heading back along the river road and see what we get spot. Okay, now Juma of course is heating up at a rate of knots. Let's head across to James so that he can entertain you for a bit longer before they head home to the shade. I must confess of course what, what there cannot be a more perfect way to end turd Fridays than with a dung beetle rolling a turd. Here we have a dung beetle rolling said turd. Now, this is probably the, not the nuptial ball. There's only one dung beetle here. So this has probably been rolled by the female. There's probably an egg inside and she's probably rolling it towards the hole in which it will be buried. Look at the strength. It is astounding. And then, of course, a little while later, possibly in the season even, the eggy will hatch. And the little dung beetle larva will eat the dung that it is, was born into and then it will emerge looking like this one eventually once it has pupated I now have thorns in my fingers it's really sore and I think what it is seeking out you might notice a fence just now it's uh, heading straight towards the, the landowner's home and perhaps it is uh, seeking the refuge offered by the fence I'm not sure why it's going that way Let's just give it one last look over here. To where are you going, my dear, with your dung? Shall we, would you like a bit of help? Shall we lift this? There you are. That's it. Now, strictly speaking, we shouldn't do that. It's interfering with nature, isn't it? Hello, Stanley, Stanley, Stanley. You say, is there an eggy inside here? Yes, there is most likely an egg inside this ball. And how it happens, Stanley, 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 as many of you will know, of course, with a dung beetle like this, a male will roll a ball and he will use it to entice a female. They'll roll it off. It's called the nuptial ball. They'll mate and eat that ball. And when they have satiated themselves, she will go off to another dung pile, roll or lay an egg in the middle of a little ball like this, and then roll it away and bury it somewhere. I don't know where she's going. I don't know how. We, we actually do have an understanding of how she knows where she's going. She'll be orientating herself with the sun. And sometimes even with the stars in the evening, they're able to do that. Here she goes under the fence. Isn't that cool? Alrighty, let's head across now to Jamie Paterson. She has got a bird uh, named after some tack. 
So, we found something lovely in, ironically enough, a place called Maji Indege, the bird water. Not quite. Uh, you get the idea. Maji water, Indege, birds. Maji Indege. Place known for spectacular bird sightings. And we're sitting with a yellow, uh, yellow billed stork. What utter nonsense am I talking? A saddle billed stork. Question quickly. You've got. You've got 30 seconds to be able to tweet and answer this. Okay, you've got 60 seconds, male or female, and go. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. This is for our regular viewers. Please don't be upset if you don't know. If you're a new viewer, I don't expect you to. I will explain the differences in a moment. But quickly, fastest finger first. Wait, where's that from? I can't remember. Was it from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I don't know. Either way, is it a male or a female saddle-billed stork? So obviously we get certain bird species where it's very, very clear which is the male and which is the female. The, the pintailed wider that you saw with Brent would be a very clear example. Oh, it got something. Bravo, Joy. Absolutely right. It is indeed a female saddle-billed stork. And the reason that we know that is because, first of all, oh, now she's going to hide. Hey, come back here, girl. It's okay. You don't need to be shy. There's obviously a good patch of something there after frogs and all sorts of things. The reason we know that she is a female is because her eyes are yellow. The males have dark eyes. They also have slight dangly wattles underneath their chins, right at the sort of the base of the bull. So this is a female saddle-billed stork. Typically you'll see them in pairs or in groups, but not in, not in groups, sorry, I'm talking nonsense. You'll see them in pairs, and you'll see them on Juma as well. So especially now after the rain has happened, hopefully the water holes are filling up nicely and will continue to fill up and you'll have a chance to see the saddle build stalks regularly regularly on the Juma waterhole camera. So I can imagine I, I having never actually been right up close to a saddle build stalk, but I imagine that those bulls are powerful and capable of doing extraordinary damage. really long and powerful. One of the biggest stork species that we see. Obviously the marabou is bigger. Which, by the way, we saw lots of marabou storks. I think some of you might be aware that Kampala was famous for the marabou storks that gathered around the, the rubbish heaps. Uh, obviously they're now conducting a serious cleanup of the city, but the marabous are still there. And a lot of the houses are coated in white from the deposited piles of excrement that the marabous have left behind. I always find their legs fascinating. The more I look, I look at them, the weirder they look. When you think of the, because I mean all animals have very, well at least in terms of birds and mammals, you've got a, a similar bone structure, a formula that obviously gets slightly altered depending on whether you're looking at a bird or a beast or whatever it may be but those bones in those legs a long 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 femur the elbow the ankle joint and the knee joint and the ankle joint it's also f fascinating in terms of construction it almost looks as though that those legs should just crumple they look so small and fragile delicately moving forward. You can see that focus searching for most likely frogs around here. There's been lots and lots of rain and I've been hearing frogs pretty much all day and every night since we got back. Oh look! We've got another big bird that's joined us. How stunning! Two of the largest birds in one sighting. Crowned cranes have come to join the mix, not content with the saddle-billed stork stealing the attention. But thankfully, it is another bird that has moved into our sighting, which gives us the opportunity to answer Stanley, Stanley, Stanley's question. Stanley, the reason that they excrete white is because birds don't urinate. So obviously they have to, much like human beings, they have to get rid of excessive nitrogen, and that's done in the, in the form of urea and it's very very highly concentrated and solid and because it is highly concentrated and solid um, urea actually goes white 
So you even see it in certain animals like, for example, the black rhino. They have highly concentrated urine. Oh, that's beautiful. They have highly concentrated urine, <clears throat> which means if you find a, a urine puddle left behind by a black rhino, you'll often see it dries with a crusty white. And that's exactly, well, not exactly the same thing, but it's very, very similar. So that is why there is always a white dollop combined with bird feces. So it's essentially ammonia that's been converted to urea. urea. Looking fabulous this morning, crowned crane. Sassy, you say now all we need is a secretary bird. We've actually got two crown cranes here, by the way. I'm pretty familiar with this pair. Yes, we need... Right, now, if a secretary bird would just arrive, and then a ground hornbill, and then preferably the one shoebill that's got lost and decided to come and join us here, then we'd have a really marvellous collection of very large birds. They don't... I mean, even the spectacular colouring of the saddle-billed stork is pales in comparison to the dramatic expression of colours and feathers and decoration that the crowned cranes carry. Aren't they stunning? Now here's an example of a bird where you can't actually tell the difference. The males are slightly larger than the females, which is something I recently found out, but not by much, so probably it's the male on the right. But there's no difference in terms of their, the, the sort of, the, the what am I looking for the words I'm trying to say? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> their colours, their feathers, their crests, their wattles, the females are the same as the males. Am I the only person when I see them that just has a desire to go and stroke that crown? Not that I would ever do it, of course, because they would be long gone and I wouldn't do that to them. A strong desire to run my ha hand across the top of that crown and feel what it feels like. Right, Adrian's going to have some serious difficulties now, so let's reposition so that we can keep filming the lovely birds. Hmm. I'm not allowed to off-road here. We'll have to do a, a three-pointer. Okay, we go. We found ourselves a good spot, but we'll sit here patiently, and while we do, we'll send you across to Brent, who's got the wonderful black rhino. Well, this is a different black rhino to the one we saw earlier. Um, the other one was heading in this general direction, but probably about a kilometer from here. And as I said, quite difficult to see. I think it's probably a female, though. Um, but as I said, quite difficult to see from this distance. Now, they are in the high usage or no off-roading zone, so we this is as close as we can get, unfortunately. Now, I have enjoyed many many hours with black rhino in different parts of Africa but I think possibly for me the most special sighting I ever had which is it's, it's a bit sad though uh, because I'm pretty sure the rhino are now then now extinct in the area I saw it which was in the southern Salu game reserve I think I must have been one of the last people to see a black rhino in Salu Very, very, very sad. But it is wonderful to be able to see them as we do here in Kenya and knowing that they are so well protected.
Now, of course, there's been some incredible work done by lots of different people uh, in the conservation of black rhino, but from an East African story point of view, they were recently reintroduced for the first time well, not for the first time, but back into Rwanda and um, into the west, well, sorry, the eastern sections of Rwanda, into Akagera National Park. So very exciting stuff there. And uh, there's other places in Malawi they've been reintroduced to. Um, so there is work on spreading them back throughout Africa. So it is, it is very exciting. And uh, I've been lucky enough to be on quite a few game captures with Rhino as well. So I've actually, there's a picture of me, I must to be about five or six years old, sitting on top of a black rhino, and a white rhino, actually. <laughs> Very lucky. Okay, well, it's quite far away, so we're going to keep moving. There's some nice ellies just behind us. Well, there were some nice ellies just behind us. Let's see if they're still there. And they are. It's just so lovely and green. I'm sure the elephants are enjoying all the greenery. Oh, that not that convenient? Right next to the road, so I'm just going to pop around towards them. Hopefully I'm going to be heading out this afternoon or during the day today. Some cheetah um, around. Oh dear, it seems as though Brent has disappeared off your screen. It was a very well-timed movement on Adrian's part. Right, so... Brent has vanished, but that's okay. We've got some warthogs to keep you entertained. We apologize for our new viewers. I mean, our regular viewers are pretty familiar with the whole concept. Sometimes things just go wrong. It's one of those, you know, we're bringing you a live safari from South Africa and Kenya. It happens. So, two remaining piglets between this... No, it's, I think it's just the one female over there. Two remaining little ones. They've grown a great deal since I was last in the Mara. When I was in the Mara, they were tiny little tiny tiny little warthog piglets dashing about the numbers of course greatly reduced Brent had a, a lion catch and kill a baby warthog yesterday during a school drive would you believe it just one of those things that happens live filming we never know what to expect off the little piglets go following along I think is this a young male I think it is Yeah, it's a young male. I thought so. I almost jumped to the conclusion that it was a was a female because it hasn't quite reached full sexual maturity. So the testicles haven't completely descended. But you can actually see it's got two sets of warts. One up near its eyes and the other down by its nose. Lucian, I could not agree more. In fact, I, I cannot believe there are people out here that don't think that warthogs are sweet. I think they're very cute, and yes, in a weird way. They admittedly probably are not winning any awards for the beauty contest out here. That would probably go to the crowned crane that we saw earlier. The frogs are deafening. Should we just have a listen quickly? Toads. Good grief. And that's because this particular area is exceptionally marshy. And the reason, that's, well, that's the reason actually that we're seeing so many different animals gathered about this spot. So it's not just the warthogs and the, the many toads. That, and frogs actually that are calling around here we've also got a water buck with her beautiful heart-shaped nose she's over there herd of zebra and the odd buffalo isn't she lovely the fussel water buck a slightly more rust color than the ones that you see in South Africa 
a pretty girl. Quick wink from our water buck to send you on your way back over to Brent who is with something just a tad larger. Oh, oh, disappearing, but he's got a stumpy tail. Let me just turn around. A disappearing elephant. Now, that was quite interesting. So we've seen quite a few different elephants that are lacking tails. Sometimes it's actually they're born without a tail. More often, it's from an injury. Sometimes hyenas, sometimes lions. Oh, hello, cheeky. Cheeky, cheeky. Are you thinking about giving me a little charge there? I mean, let's just go forward a bit. There we go. And you can see this one is lacking a tail, which can be quite irritating with the amount of flies there are in the Mara. Hey guys, what you up to? Oh, you found yourself a nice little creeper there. That looks yummy. Oh, it's so nice to just sit quietly with elephants. Let's just go have a look at the tail. Let's see if this is an old injury. I think that looks like an old injury that's healed. So it could be lions, could have been hyenas. It's almost impossible to know. Very peaceful morning here in the Mara. Oh, Archie, can you tell me what they're saying? I can't. I can't. Uh, can we repeat that, please? Joe wants to know why this little elephant only has one tusk as well. Well, sometimes elephants are only born with one tusk. Normally, they're actually it's broken at either playing or play fighting or sometimes even on feeding. So it is, and sometimes elephants have no tusks and that can be natural. And uh, normally when you have one tusk, it's more likely that it's been broken off rather than being born with one tusk, but it is possible for elephants to be born with one tusk. We definitely see less broken tusks here in the Mara because the elephant's diet is oh, so much easier. Now, Cheryl is wondering, do elephants get cancers and melanomas? Well, Cheryl, there's some really interesting research going into that at the moment, and they seem to have a super gene that um, beats cancer, so it's very, very rare for them to get cancer in wild populations. Now, in... in populations that have been kept in in captivity for a long time where there's possibly quite a bit of inbreeding um there is a chance that they will more likely have cancer but it is very unlikely that elephants will get cancer so it's it's uh, what they've got in their genetics is is, is called a tumor su suppressor gene. So it actually suppresses the growth of tumors. So that's why elephants very, very seldom uh, ever get cancer. And I know there's quite a lot of research going into it. Now, we're going to leave these elephants as they head slowly down towards the Mara River. Well, it's quite far away still. But Jamie's with another member of the Big Five. Another member, well, several members actually, of the Big Five, we've stumbled upon a, quite a small herd of buffalo. So a breeding herd of buffalo, lots of youngsters in this herd. Very sweet little calves. The one on the right is my favorite actually. Oh, mom's just walked straight in front of it. And of course, as always, accompanied by the escort of ox pickers that you'll always find in a sighting like this. Lovely thing about the Mara on Juma, we see 
yellow-billed oxpeckers every now and again. In the Mara, we see them pretty much all the time. In fact, they're the more common of the two oxpecker species. So the little birds sitting on top of the female there. You can see half red, half yellow-billed. Hence, it is a yellow-billed oxpecker because the name red-billed oxpecker was already taken. It's fascinating to watch them as they hop about. You can actually really see the hey, <laughs> stiffened tail feathers of the oxpeckers as well as their feet that are well adapted. Hey, it's gone now. <laughs> Rebecca, who is in final control in Juma, oh, not in Juma, talking nonsense, up in the Mara, said that that particular buffalo looked as though it had a mohawk, and indeed it did. I have a question, because up until I started this particular line of work, I never thought I'd begin to recognize individual buffalo. But because we see things through the eye of the camera, we observe details that we might not have observed otherwise. I never expected to be able to recognize different male buffalo, although I did used to put together ID kits for buffalo herds, but that was in a restricted context rather than a wild one. But my question for you is, the Taylor Lautner buffalo, has anybody seen that bull recently? I know that the the buffalo have been largely absent from the northern part of the Sabi sand, but please, if if the Taylor Lautner buffalo makes an appearance, would you please let me know? And please don't tell Taylor Lautner that we named a buffalo after him. I think he'd be terribly offended. Or perhaps he wouldn't. Perhaps he'd find it amusing. I don't know. Either way, the, the buffalo's horn's very distinctive, and his boss is very distinctive, and just looks like him in some indescribable way. Healthy looking buffalo, shiny noses, well fed, very good looking. You can finish chewing that mouthful of grass. Oh, juvenile oxpecker by the way. Those of you who were observant would have spotted it. No colour on its bill. Hey! a ju Juvenile on a little baby calf. How appropriate. Two babies. <laughs> oh, oh, not my eye. Infuriating bird. Ah, uh, little one, that's your lot in life, I'm afraid. R Rishi, um, in terms of the, the buffalo, I'm going to reposition slightly so that... Adrian doesn't have to film the, the pole of the roof. Um, in terms of the Mara buffalo compared to the, the South African buffalo, the difference in the horns just lies purely in size. They are so much larger here than they are in South Africa, and that's a combination, I think, of genetics and food availability. And with good food availability, obviously, you get plenty of competition and the best genetics win through. Hello, flows. Nothing looks at you quite like a buffalo. So you get plenty of competition and I guess genetics have just been selected for that they have large horns. So if we have a look at that male over there, off on the left, I mean he's a relatively average sized buffalo. Um, if we go a little bit further to the left, a bit further, a bit further, a bit further, he's the one in front. The one, in, the guy in the front. That's the girl. <laughs> a bit further to the left. There, that dude. Uh, he, he is... Um, He's pretty much average size for this area, and for, for Juma, he'd be a large buffalo. So, combination of slight genetic differences and an increased competition and good nutrition, I think, is what's all combined. And on average, the buffalo here are heavier and larger than those in South Africa. Ah, Susie, a hierarchy in buffalo herds. This is going to sound like something really very weird, but this is this is what biologists, behavioral biologists or, or naturalists have concluded. So in terms of hierarchy, obviously the bulls are, the big males are the ones that help, will have access to the females. There's no strict hierarchy between the big males, but they're the biggest and the strongest, and therefore they are the ones that will be doing the most pushing and shoving. If there's a female in estrus and two evenly matched males, they will fight. Um, and then essentially the females 
will be the ones that decide where the herd moves. And people have done research into the fact that females will, the older females will stand up, look in a direction, lie down, look in that direction. And the, the herd will then move in the direction that the majority of the females were looking in. I know. Uh, you'll have to, we'll have to trust the researchers on this, that this is the, the conclusion that they drew. And that is that buffalo vote democratically as to which way they're going to go. Um, that's right up there with wild dogs sneezing to decide whether they're going to hunt. But it's an interesting one and it's an observation. And I'm not going to contest it in any way. I am very much sitting in the middle of the road. I, I literally couldn't block the road anymore if I tried. So I'm going to have to move even though we've only got... A few short minutes before the end of the safari. Let me scoot up here. There we go. Right. One last look at the buffalo before we reach the end of our extended sunrise safari. Isn't it lovely? You get an extra hour of sunrise safari. So last look at the buffalo as we bring to the end or the conclusion the sunrise safari between kenya and south africa so it's time to do our goodbyes and our thank yous a big thank you and a congratulations to adrian i think you'll all agree he's done an extraordinary job as well as to kirsty directing in south africa ably assisted by rebecca in the mara the entire team in south africa and the masai mara our tech team and our behind the scenes crew but of course, as you all know, the most important thank you and farewell goes to all of you. It wouldn't have been nearly as much fun as it has been without you joining us. And who else would have joined in with the topi battle in the way that you did? Thanks so much, everyone. And we will see you this afternoon for the Sunset Safari.